Episode 9, the choose-your-own-adventure element of the first season of Subject Bound was brought to you by my patrons. Thank you for all you do. If you enjoy the show, head over to patreon.com forward slash Paul Sading. Join up, support the show at a level that is comfortable for you. Also, stay tuned for a very special preview of my short story, Salt and Pepper, after this episode. And patrons, remember, at the end of this episode, Jared is going to be faced with a dilemma, a decision. You have to decide for Jared his course of action. In episode 10, the season finale, you will receive two versions of the season finale. You choose the one that aligns with your decision for Jared. This is my small way of thanking those of you who support this show in a way that helps me keep it growing. I hope you enjoy. Now for the episode. You've got to get the evidence that will convince people that it's real. I haven't recorded a series in a few days. I couldn't. Between what happened during my last expedition with Lucas, getting that unwelcome visitor at the camp, almost needing to shoot a Sasquatch, and everything that's going on with Maria, I just haven't felt up to it. I'm worn pretty thin. As far as Maria is concerned, she's coming around. We're actually going out tonight, but uh, I'm not exactly confident about my chances. I, uh... I think I really screwed this one up. But we'll see, right? I don't give up easily. I'm on my way to Peter's house. You'll remember he's the zoologist and friend who's been with me almost from the start of my investigation. All those years ago. I've only had a chance to briefly talk to him since he asked me to hold off on my investigation because of threats he'd received. He's assured me he's safe. But he's concerned... I could hear it in his voice. On a lighter note, (laughs) Lucas is a believer now. (laughs) And he didn't even need to see the Sasquatch. An impressive conversion, if you ask me. But seriously, he's really bothered. I didn't want him to see how rattled I was because I honestly thought he was going to lose it out there. Another minute or two of that Sasquatch prying outside our camp and I'm convinced Lucas would have went running into the darkness and probably killed himself falling off a cliff before a Sasquatch would have had the chance to do it for him. (laughs) He, He really was unhinged. I'm almost at Peter's house now. I'll start the recording when I'm inside. So it's been quiet? Yes. I don't know what happened, but I haven't heard a peep since I asked you to stop the investigation. Weird. It is. Doesn't mean I'm still not asking you to stop, though. Have you thought about it at all? By the way, how are things with Maria? Well, I'll let you know in a few days. (laughs) We're getting together tonight to talk. I don't want to fill in any blanks when it comes to us. She seems to be all over the place. Can you blame her? It's not like this is normal or easy. Hell, your dog was killed right in front of her. Over this? How does anyone process something like that? I totally get where she's at. I've only recently started to feel okay again. Getting confronted by those thugs really rattled me. I can only imagine how scary it was for her. Someone really doesn't want you carry on your work. And sorry, buddy, but it's dangerous to be associated with you right now. Then why am I here? Sorry. I didn't mean to sound like that. I'm a little stressed. Jared, we're friends. We go way back. I don't give up on friends, even if I have to keep them at a distance from time to time. I'm not giving up on you either. I just want you to make the best decision for yourself and everyone around you. That's all. I hope you know that. I'll always support you. I know. It's appreciated. Well, I've got something that might excite you. An email. 
came in from an organizational box, some small company out of Port Angeles. Looks like they have about 50 employees, so there's no telling who sent it without doing some digging, and that's out of my lane. Plus, it puts people at unnecessary risk. What did it say? That's the thing. It had an attachment, an MP3. Let me play it. You'll like it. I don't get it. Night sounds? Did I miss something? Let me play a second version for you. I had a friend take the one you just heard and isolate the sound I want you to hear. Now, listen here. You'll pick it out, no problem. Sweet Jesus. That's remarkable. Authentic? Yep. I trust this guy, and he said he has no idea what made that sound. But whatever it is, the file is legit. The signals, pitch, all outside the human scale. It isn't one of us. You and I both know what that was. Did this anonymous emailer happen to mention where they recorded it? Near the Elwha Ranger Station on Olympic Hot Springs Road. A ranger? I doubt it. It came from some sales office in a small business. Wouldn't be a ranger, unless the ranger works there part-time or has a friend covering for them. That makes sense. Wait a second. The Olympic Hot Springs Road? The emailer claimed it came from near there? Yes. Why? Peter, that's not even five miles from Whiskey Bend. That's where I was with Lucas the other night. I need to get going. Wait, Jared, I thought... I'm going to see Maria before I do anything else. I just have to pack up a few things to make that drive back up to Port Angeles. The house. Man, it's still so weird to not have to worry about someone taking care of Molly. I need to finish this investigation. I know Peter struggles to share things with me. I can appreciate that. I know it can't be easy for him. On one hand, needing to look out for his own safety and... On the other, he knows he's feeding into the very thing I need in order to get closure in my life. Plus, he's a man of science. Part of him has got to be rooting for me to find this thing. I don't envy him. I just hope he can understand that this is it. After this, I'm done. It's a beautiful day for a drive, though. That'll take my mind off. What the... Shut up. I'm doing the talking. Who the hell are you? It doesn't matter, now does it? Uh uh The only thing that matters is that you hear me nice and clear, you got it? You're going to stop this little child's play of yours. There are people who aren't very happy with your insistence to keep pursuing your work, even after we've made it very clear that it'd be wise to stop. You're making serious enemies strong, enemies that are powerful and have a vested interest in what you're doing. They've been watching you and hoping you were smart enough to stop while you still could, before they needed to stop you. Consider this your last warning, Mr. Strong. The next time you see us, you won't have to worry about making any decisions. (laughs) We mean it, Strong. This is your last chance. I didn't stay in the driveway for long. As soon as those thugs pulled away, I got up and got the hell away from the house. I didn't want to be around if they decided to come back and finish what they started. I have no idea who these guys are. I'm not even sure who these people are who have a vested interest in what I'm doing. I'm looking for a goddamn animal. Why would that matter to anyone? (sighs) 
I just want to get to Maria. What? Jared, this is crazy. Why didn't you call the police? I, I don't know. What? I, I just wanted to get to you. I needed to see you. It sounds juvenile, I know, but the only thing I could think of was getting to you. And I knew if I called the cops, I'd be tied up with them all day. I didn't want that. I wanted to be with you. Okay, Jared. Give me your hand, please. I'm worried. This has gone beyond anything it was supposed to be. Forget you and me and what we're going through. Think about Peter, Molly, you. These people are obviously serious. This isn't some game of prank callers or kids vandalizing something. These are grown men capable of hurting you. I'm aware of that, Maria. I know how serious this is. Do you? Do you really understand how far this has gone now? How much longer, Jared? How much longer? I'm almost done. I'm so close. You've got to be kidding me. You're still insisting on pursuing this? You're willing to give up everything for some legend? Please, keep your voice down. I'd ask you to stop. To stop for us. But... Is there even an us to do it for? I love you. You make it hard, but... I love you. None of this changes any of that. You don't think I know that you're struggling right now? You're not doing this for your ego. You're not doing it to get rich or famous. I know that. You need closure. And this is the only way you're going to get it. So you're okay with me finishing? I'm not okay with any of it. Somewhere out there is a normal life waiting for us. I'm rooting against you. But only because I'm being selfish. You're not the only one struggling with this, you know. If I have to ask you to stop, you'll never get the closure you need. And what does that say about me? But if I give up and let you keep going, I worry what will happen to you. I'm close, babe. I'm really close. I'm sure you are. You've been getting closer year after year. You've put a lot into your work. No, really. I get it. You're close. Lucas and I went on an expedition and had a Sasquatch almost in our camp. It was close enough to smell it. What? It was right outside our camp. There were some wood knocks and a couple different calls. Then they started throwing rocks at us. There had to be at least three of them. That's when we smelled it. It was scary. I could hear it walking around just outside the firelight like it was scouting us. I know where they are, Maria. I'm so close to getting credible evidence. So close, I can taste it. Then, then I can walk away. Okay. Okay. I'm here for you, no matter what. Here for me, but not with me? I can't promise you that. For all I know, you could be doing this for another year or, or another ten. There's no telling. The reason I left in the first place was because I need to get on with my life. You know that. And that... That hasn't changed. I'm sorry. Maria, you have nothing to apologize for. The apologies are all mine. I'm going to make this up to you. After you found Bigfoot. What do you say? Let's enjoy lunch and talk about something else. Okay. It does smell good. What did you say your name was? Jared Strong. And you're investigating Bigfoot? Like the monster on that TV show? Oh, hey. Are you from that show? Is this going to be on TV? <laughs> no, sorry, I'm not. I'm an independent investigator, one of the little guys, thus the uh, lack of a camera crew. Oh, okay. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Do you really do this as a job? I don't mean to offend, I just didn't know this was a real thing. <laughs> it's okay. A lot of people ask me that. Yeah, it, uh, it can be a job. I'm not going to get rich, but that's not why I do it. Then why? 
Again, I don't want to be rude, but it's kind of weird for me. A grown man chasing monsters? <laughs> I'm really sorry. Maybe it's because I'm in these woods all the time. I just think it's kind of strange to think Bigfoot exists. I mean, why haven't they caught one yet? Or even found bones? Or a body? Well, the acidity of the soil here isn't good for preservation. The deep forest doesn't help either. Plus, it's not unheard of to not find fossils or remains in forested areas. There are 2.3 million square kilometers of forest in the Congo, for example, and six archaeological sites, none of which have produced a single chimpanzee fossil, though we know there are huge population centers of them all over that area, right? It's similar here with our forests, and Sasquatch at best, probably only numbers in the dozens, not the hundreds or thousands. Needle in a haystack, then. And that's a good way to put it. I just need to find that needle. Even if it's just a Denisovan finger. A what? Uh, I'm just being a wise ass. Denisovans are extinct, but they were a species that existed alongside Homo sapiens, who interbred with them. They were classified after a finger bone segment was found in a cave in Siberia in 2008. Scientists were able to extract DNA thanks to the cave's average temperature being low enough to preserve it. That's how they discovered it was a separate species. We don't have that sort of fortune with Bigfoot. Makes it a little more difficult than some people would like to have to consider. Selective data and all that. Sorry? Nothing. <laughs> I'm just a bitter old man. <laughs> no worries. So what can I do for you then if I can't help you find this... this... Denosovan finger? Well, are there a lot of rangers working out of this station? A few of us. But there's not usually more than one or two in here at a given time. We spend most of our shifts out in our vehicles patrolling and stuff. Is there a way to get a question to everyone? Mr... Jared. Please, just call me Jared. Well, Jared, why all the weird questions? <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> My interrogation skills suck. I recently received a recording via email of some sounds of what I think might be a Sasquatch. The sender didn't provide any details about who they were, but they did mention that they were very close to this station when they recorded it. I was hoping someone here would know more about that. I mean, I could post a note, but you know how people are about reading boards. No one will ever bother with it, most likely. Are you all on an internal email system? We are, yes. I, I could do that. Thanks, I'd really appreciate it. I'm gonna be camping up here for a few days. There are a couple of spots I'd like to check out, so I won't have any cell service, but... If you wouldn't mind texting me at this number if anyone has any information, I'd be grateful. Sure thing. Thanks. Jared? Yeah. Um, this recording you said you had? What about it? I might know something about it. Oh? How? Because I recorded it. It was last week. I was coming in late from a patrol and sort of taking my time. <laughs> There's a guy who started working here a few weeks ago, and... And... He's hot? Yeah. <laughs> you could say that. I... I don't know. I get dumb around him. And I said something embarrassing the day before, and I was trying to avoid him. So you took your time coming back from patrol. Stupid, I know. I need to grow up. Oh, I wasn't saying that. Plus, the last person you need to take relationship advice from is me. Trust me. Oh, so sorry to hear that. Yeah, uh, so I was coming in late. The sun was already below the horizon, but I'm really comfortable out there, so it didn't bother me. I've been here for seven years already, so I know those woods pretty well. The dark? Yeah, that's nothing. I was walking back to my truck when I heard something. I had no idea what it was. I, I mean, I've heard stuff like that before, once in a while over the past few years, but it freaked me out this time. Why this time? <sighs> You're going to think I'm crazy. No, I'm not. I've seen and experienced a lot of stuff other people would lock me up for if I told them. There's nothing you can say that would make me think you're crazy. Well, 
Except for telling me you think Bigfoot is a trans-dimensional creature. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> no, no, nothing like that. It's just that, see, we're a small station. Not a lot of turnover, and we all know each other pretty well. We talk. A lot. A few months ago, we started recognizing each other's daily status reports had some common details in them. Weird noises, like trees being hit or something. And deer mutilations. Lots of them. Bad smells without any obvious reasons. Stuff we're not just used to seeing or hearing, so we jot down notes. Often enough that some of us started reporting it, and enough that we noticed it in each other's reports. We started reading them like they were the newspapers or something. Then there was the weird stuff. Like what? Footprints. Lots of them. All over the mountain. I know, I know. I swear I'm not a psycho. I honestly wouldn't have thought anything about any of this. But then the other stuff started happening. You're going to force me to ask you each time, aren't you? Stuff like this isn't supposed to happen. I'm... I'm sorry. I just thought if I had a friend send that file, then someone would do whatever Bigfoot people do and I'd be left alone. I didn't think one of you would show up here, at my work. I just want it to be... taken care of. Listen, I can leave if you're uncomfortable, but I'm just trying to help. I don't mean to ask you to relive anything you don't want to. I know. Sorry. A couple of us have had stones, like big rocks, thrown at us. One of our trucks had its hood caved in. The ranger who brought it in, Scott, he kept the rock. It was as big as a basketball. The hood on his truck was crushed like five inches. He probably would have gotten in trouble over it, but so much weird stuff has been happening, I guess we're all expecting stuff like this now. It's crazy. And then, the howls. We started noticing them, I mean, we started documenting them, about a half year ago. But we've been hearing them for longer. I can't speak for the other rangers, but I figured they were wolves. <laughs> Which is stupid, because wolves don't live out here, and they don't sound like that. The first few times I heard them, I've never heard anything so chilling. Then, there was one time a few months ago when I heard one and then another in a completely different direction a few seconds later. There's no way whatever it was that howled like that could have moved the distance it would have needed to in order to pull that off. No joke, I started crying a little. You heard a call in response. Is that what they're called? Yeah then, I guess so. I started keeping my weapon close to me after that. I don't blame you. Are they dangerous? I thought you didn't think they existed. I... Yeah, they can be dangerous. Very dangerous. I'm leaving the ranger station now. That was an interesting conversation. More evidence of rising Sasquatch activity in this specific part of the Olympics. I can't help but be frustrated, though. An entire crew of rangers has been reporting strange events, and those reports get lost in the void. Nothing's done. It came down to a scared ranger secretly sending an audio file to get some attention, some movement. It's this type of thinking about Sasquatch which discredits most skeptics, at least in the Bigfoot community. These skeptics pride themselves on being critical thinkers, but one of the essential elements of being an actual critical thinker is to recognize and challenge your biases. Information like what these rangers have reported should raise flags for a whole lot of people because they should be seeing the trends and preponderance of evidential occurrences. It should lead them to thinking and asking. I... Who the hell is this? Hello? Ah, Jared Strong. So nice to finally get to speak with you. Who is this? My name is irrelevant, but you may call me Roger. I was hoping I could catch you before you 
drove out beyond cell phone range. I don't think I know. Excuse me? My representatives tell me you're out near Whiskey Bend. Just finished visiting the ranger station near there, I hear. Even after you met some of my men earlier. You're either incredibly brave or incredibly stupid. Who the hell are you? And what the hell do you want with me? A meeting, Mr. Strong. That's all. I'd like to sit down with you and see if there isn't an amicable solution to this predicament we find ourselves in. I know you're in a hurry to set up before it gets too late, but I'd like to meet you for a quick meal so we can discuss this matter. My treat, of course. What do you say? Before we end uh, this time together, remember, hang around for that special preview of Salt and Pepper. Now, I want to thank uh, and welcome Shelly as the newest patron of Subject Found. And I want to thank both Monica and Kevin for increasing their patronage of the show. These three wonderful people have helped me be able to reinvest in the show. And that patron support is what keeps the show coming to everyone. So to everyone who does listen... You have those patrons to thank for this show being produced. It takes a lot of time, literally half a year of effort between myself, writing, editing, and all the logistic stuff, and then a few months for Brian Bristol to produce this show. This is a massive undertaking, as are all audio dramas, where there are full soundscapes uh, and, and a number of actors. So those patrons help bring this show you want to have a second season of the show, a third season, a tenth season? Become a patron over at patreon.com forward slash Paul Sading. Those are the things that help people in audio drama keep producing. So I want to thank Shelly, Kevin, and Monica for your very warm, very welcomed, very selfless contributions to the show and to keep me going. It really means a lot. Also, leave those iTunes reviews as well iTunes reviews are another way to help this show get attention and and to help it. So maybe you can't become a patron, but anybody can do a rating and review, right? So five-star ratings and reviews is what I'm looking for, and I really appreciate them. You also get a mention on the show. For example, Anvil 13 out of the United Kingdom caught my attention, kept my attention. It was refreshing to find a subject found. Enjoying the storyline and the way it's heading. The voice acting and sound is great, which helps immerse you in the storyline. Top work and cannot wait for the next episode. Thank you, Anvil13 from the UK. Staying over in Europe, Smurly out of Switzerland. My first ever review out of Switzerland. Amazing show, exploring a new topic, the search for Bigfoot. It has been interesting with three-dimensional characters and can't wait for the next episode. Smurly. Uh, the fact that you highlight the characters really, really means a lot. Thank you for that comment. Another five star from Aussie Caribou. We're going down to Australia this time. Three for three overseas. Come on, U.S., step up. Outstanding way to spend a day, Aussie Caribou says. They love parazoology and a good mystery. So, obviously, Subject Found was right up their alley. However... Even without the interest in the subject, I'd thoroughly enjoy this podcast. I feel like I'm transported back in the days at the old farmhouse when visiting my older relatives where we huddled around the radio and would listen to old radio plays well into the night. This production demonstrates the excellent writing, production, and acting of those shows. It adds to my memories by clear sound quality and some amazing sound effects. On more than one occasion, I found myself staring outside my darkened windows Expecting to see Bigfoot looking back. <laughs> that is awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you very much, Aussie Caribou. Totally great review. And then the last one, finally from the U.S. TH Walk says, I love it. Five stars. Adam of the Bigfoot stores. This is one of the best I've heard. Paul Sadine is a genius. He has the best podcast out there, in my opinion. And he can do no wrong in content he puts out. If I could, I'd rate you a thousand stars. You're the man, Paul. <laughs> yes. I don't necessarily agree with you, TH Walk. Um, 
but I try. And and isn't that what we're all looking for? Is just bring your A game, do the best you can do. That's all anyone can ask for. To the four of you, thank you very much for those reviews. They truly mean a lot. They really help overseas reviewers. Thank you so much. I know it's a Bigfoot thing, which tends to be very central to uh, the United States and, and maybe some other parts of the world that really focus on it, uh, like the Yeti in the Himalayas or something. But in the English-speaking world, we're the Bigfoot geeks, right? Uh, Canada is as well, but Canada, I'm not seeing you on these reviews. I'm so close to Canada that literally, geographically, it breaks my heart. So come on, Canada, step up. Let's let's get some reviews in. Uh, another note, I wanted to thank everybody. January broke the record for downloads for the show by over 35%. Saw at least a 35% increase in downloads in the month of January for over the previous monthly record. Thank you so much to everyone who is downloading and listening and then telling other people about it. That really meant a lot. I've got to get you over to the free preview of Salt and Pepper. couple things. Um, before I do, I want to hit the actor credits. I also want to let you know, over on the website, foundstories.com, there's a store. It's not really a store because I'm not sure if I want to spend the extra money every single month on it. There's basically links on a page that I named store. There are some short stories that I'm starting to put out there. The full version of Salt and Pepper can be bought from there. Also... There's The Plant, which is a horror story based on the Tri-Counties, which is a fictional area that I created for the Atheist Apocalypse podcast. Um, but the, the story itself is a horror story that you might enjoy. They're reasonably priced. I ask everyone, go out there, buy the PDF and the MP3 version. Very reasonable prices, and all of it, again, gets funneled back into me being able to grow these productions, spend more time on them, hire people who can do a better job at sound than I can, right? Things like that. So go over there. If you're looking for more short story, short stories, I know there's a lot of free content out there, but again, with content that remains free, uh, people come and they go because it takes a lot of time to do this and it's hard to keep sacrificing family time or quality time that you could be doing other things. Uh, on something that's not coming back into your life in some form or fashion. Keep me around. Keep me uh, bringing in voice actors and sound and music talent to creating these things by going out and supporting me. Again, over at foundstories.com forward slash stores. Now, let's do this last bit and then take you into Salt and Pepper. Subject Found is a pulsating production in association with Fate Crafter Studios. This episode was written and edited by Paul Sading. It was produced by Brian Bristol. I want to thank everybody for downloading this episode 9 of Subject Found, Bigfoot. And be sure that you listen to the season finale in two weeks. Obviously, this episode, Jared had a decision to make. You were going to make that decision for him. If you're a patron, you're going to get two versions of the ending that align with the decision you made for him. If you want to become a patron and take advantage of that, head over to patreon.com forward slash Paul Sading. If you have sightings that you would like to report to Jared, you can do that over at foundstories.com or foundstories at gmail.com and we'll get it into Jared's hands. John McLean is Jared Strong. You can find more of John's work at jmacvo.com and at dogandponystudios.net. Maria Strong is played by Heather Auden. Michael Kennedy, who brings Peter Beckingham to life, can be found at IamYourVoiceOver.com. The thug is Stephen Bateman. I work with Stephen on Atheist Apocalypse. You know him as Edwin Bonshift, the entertainment reporter over there. He's also part of Pants Pending Studios, and you can find all of his other work at PantsPending.com. Stephanie McCoy, the park ranger, is voiced by Rebecca Thomas. You've heard her on Diary of a Madman, and you can also find more of her work over at stage32.com forward slash Carolyn. And last but definitely not least, uh, someone who also edited some of the content in this episode, so 
so I have to give an extra special shout out to him. Roger Howard is played by Edward Champion. Edward is another audio drama person, and he's got a his his own big production coming very soon that we need to keep our eyes out on for. But right now, you can find all of Edward's work over on edrants.com. Of course, I will put all these links in the show notes. If you would like to become a patron, go over to patreon.com forward slash Paul Sading. Lastly, go to the site, find out how you can subscribe to the show, where you can leave ratings and reviews. All that stuff goes a long way. Until next episode, until the season finale, until the end of season one, remember, all that is lost must be found. All right, listeners, here it is. A sample, a nice long sample of my short story. It's a LGBTQ love story called Salt and Pepper. If you are interested in hearing the conclusion of the story, head over to foundstories.com forward slash stores and pick up the MP3 and the PDF of the story to support me and keep me writing. Thank you. Jessie stewed, her thoughts twisting and jumbled, and failing to bring the clarity she desperately needed. She didn't understand. She didn't understand the world or her own place in it. She wanted to, but understanding wouldn't come, no matter how forcefully she tried to shove the distractions from her mind. Finding little progress in making sense of her life Jessie instead focused on spinning the salt shaker in her hands, getting lost in the motion of that tiny container. She almost knocked her cup of Pepsi off the table, hardly concerned about making a mess since it was more ice than soda. How difficult would cleaning up ice actually be? She was barely aware of the danger she was creating for the plastic cup of ice spruced with a hint of Pepsi. Droplets of condensation slowly trace her way down toward the table, forming a clear ring around the bottom of that cup. Jessie tried to remember which chemical reactions were necessary for condensation to form, but her recall was as poor as her understanding of what had gone wrong since last night. The mental energy just wasn't there anymore. She easily forgave herself. There was no way she could think straight. Not when her life had been turned upside down less than 18 hours ago. Not when she had no idea what she was going to walk into when she got home. Or what the world would look like tomorrow. This can't be real, she thought. It can't be. It just can't be. Begging, pleading, hoping, or praying. None of it was going to help because none of it had helped to this point. Why would she fool herself into thinking it could now? No one cared and nothing was going to change. Except everything. Her waitress, a good decade older than her, with badly managed auburn hair, kept glancing her way as if she fully expected Jessie to bolt from the restaurant without paying for her uneaten meal. Jessie resented her for that. She didn't appreciate being targeted or having people make stupid assumptions because of her age. And she definitely didn't like people making her feel that being young was equivalent to being irresponsible. There were times she felt that unfair label was bolted to her forehead. The price of being associated with her peers who did do stupid things far too often, she guessed. Jessie shot the waitress with the bad hair her vilest look. Then the waitress instinctively turned away and pretended to distract herself with something on the point-of-sale computer screen in front of her. That's for being nasty, Jessie felt a fleeting moment of pride. Jessie rolled the salt shaker on its base. How had everything unraveled so quickly? Everything, literally everything, had been lined up since she was a freshman. Everything had its place in the order. For years, all throughout her teens, she sacrificed when others goofed off. She buckled down and studied when others were busy going to parties. 
She skipped date nights that cost her a rewarding relationship with a wonderful person. She'd spent far too many weekends cooped up inside her parents' house, skipping out on a lot of joyous nights with her besties that would have recharged her. She was right to be angry, and no one was going to get away with faulting her or explaining away what happened with platitudes. That gonna be all, or are you waiting on someone? The redhead waitress snapped her gum, glancing nervously at that spinning salt shaker. Jessie guessed it made the bitch feel better to say that, to highlight that no one would be joining her. Not for this meal. Not for any meal today. And probably not for months to come until she was able to get over the heartbreak and move forward. Yes, Jessie answered, more meek than mad. The waitress, Stacy, her name tag read, slapped a green and white striped piece of paper down on the table just far enough away that Jessie would have to stretch to reach it when she was ready to pay. So very passive-aggressive of you, Jessie thought. What was it with other girls that made them treat each other like shit? Didn't they have enough struggles with guys giving them grief all the time? Did some women have nothing better to do with their time than to add troubles and stress to other women's lives? Waitress Stacy bounced away back to her cubbyhole, and, from all appearances, taking great pleasure in slighting Jessie. Jessie quickly spun the salt shaker. It wobbled on its pointy glass edge, nearly toppling. She grabbed it in a tight fist before it dumped its contents on the table. Thinking. She wanted to crush that glass until it exploded, thrusting jagged slivers into her palm, making her bleed. The pain would feel good. It would erase what she was feeling now, and any feeling would be better than this utter emptiness. Laughter sprung suddenly from a couple at the table a few feet away, and Jessie found herself struggling to look away from them. The man and woman were in their late 20s, maybe early 30s. It was always hard to tell with old people, and appeared to be married. Both wore rings, and she was too young to be jaded into thinking the only happy couples were ones where both partners were cheating. She tried not to stare and forced herself to focus on that spinning salt shaker. The simple glass shell seemed to effortlessly control thousands of disorganized grains of salt that it contained. She envied the simplicity of how something as strange as cooled liquid sand could maintain the order she could only dream of. The order that would bring her happiness, the couple at the table displayed for all to see. She found herself hating them, and then hating herself for hating them. It wasn't their fault she'd lost everything. It wasn't their fault they found something hundreds of millions of people on any given day were unsuccessfully searching for. These two were simply living the joy Jesse knew could be found, and that wasn't worthy of hatred. She'd had that joy, just yesterday, in fact. She'd immersed herself in that kind of transcendent bliss, a place where the chaos of the world couldn't touch her, less than 24 hours ago. Just yesterday. Why? She could feel the tears coming, welling in the corners of her eyes. She could feel the tingling of their salty arrival. No. I'm not going to cry, she thought. She's not going to make me cry. Not here. Not in public in front of that stupid waitress. Not in front of a happy couple. I won't. I won't allow it. She wanted to cry. Crying made everything right again. It didn't make sense why, but it didn't need to. She just wanted it. Normalcy. She wanted everything like it was supposed to be, like she'd planned it to be and worked so hard to achieve. Things should be just like her father told her they needed to be if she wanted to realize her dreams. Now the couple at the table were holding hands, giving each other cute smiles similar to the ones Jessie shared just yesterday with her own 
most important person in the world. She used to get lost in her lover's eyes and the soft feel of her skin when they held hands. Those moments were magic. The rest of the entire world melted away when they were together. It didn't disappear. It was always there, but just slightly out of reach, faded into the background. She was going to miss those times. She was going to miss her. Her resolve and control dissolved. The salt shaker toppled over as the tears came. She didn't bother to stop them. The salty trails plotted a neat and orderly course down her cheeks, over her lips, and dripped to the table. Jessie blotted them away with a cheap napkin, hoping no one saw. When she dared to look up, she saw the woman from the happy couple table looking in her direction. The woman's expression marked with sympathy. In fact, the couple had completely stopped laughing and cooing and awing at each other, and the woman mouthed something to her partner. Jesse couldn't be bothered by their concern for her, even if their empathetic interest felt invasive. She tried to quickly sweep the spilled salt into her palm. At least this was one mess she'd made that she could clean up. The tears didn't make it easy. She wanted to sob wanted to cry out, wanted to scream at the world that it wasn't fair she was going to be alone with the woman that she had loved, the woman she loved, on the other side of the world. Jesse wanted everyone to know that he didn't deserve their happy routines while she plummeted into an empty emotional void. Her chest began heaving. Fearing she was putting on a show for everyone, she briefly considered heading back home but she couldn't be at her parents' house either. The last thing she wanted was to be suffocated by the walls of her bedroom. That's why she was here, because there were only so many tears she could cry in that damn room. Only so many times she could tolerate either her mother or her father poking their heads in to check on her or to sit on her bed, telling her that everything would be okay before she wanted to jump out her window to a blissful eternity. Simultaneously, she felt suffocated and empty, alone and overwhelmed, and she couldn't make heads or tails of which way was up. Her thoughts were jumbled. At once, she thought of nothing while thinking of everything. It wasn't supposed to be like this. Not at all. What you've just listened to is the free preview of the short story, Salt and Pepper. If you would like to hear the story in full, head on over to foundstories.com forward slash stores. You'll find the link there to the audio and the PayPal where you can purchase the story in full. Thank you for the download and listen. Thank you for your interest in this short story. And thank you for supporting me in my writing and helping me invest back into these shows. There will be more to come in the future, so stay tuned. But for now, head on over to foundstories.com forward slash stores to find the link for the rest of the story.